Hello everybody, Devin here again with a helmet video, and this video is at the request of LEGO Designs. He wanted to see a uh, World War II helmet, and this is one that's very uh, overshadowed by the M1. This was actually used for the first two years of World War II, and um, it continued to be used on into the 50s and 60s actually in one form or another by like the Merchant Navy and everything like that. But this in front of you is the M1917A1. And it's the American version of the Brody helmet. And we'll get into the history behind how this helmet came about and everything like that. Um, the U.S. entered World War I without a helmet like pretty much every other army. And they decided to adopt the British Brody design. And the British Brody design was designed by a guy named Brody. And it was pretty much just a single sheet of steel that was pressed. Uh, the first ones were made out of mild steel, and they found out that that was really too soft and too prone to denting, and it actually uh, still allowed a lot of head injuries, so they increased the manganese content in the steel to make it a stronger steel. And uh, the U.S. Uh, had an oil cloth and, like, net liner and a wool pad at the top, and it was all held in place by one rivet at the top, and the chin strap was held on. It was leather by two rivets, and the way you can tell them apart real easy first off between the M1917 and the M1917A1 is this cotton chin strap. Because uh, the 1917s have a leather one, the A1s have a cotton canvas chin strap. Um, so, the Americans entered World War I in 1917. They decided to adopt the British Brody pattern helmet design. And they they made a few changes to the liner. By, that, by now, the British had been using the Brody helmet for about a year. And they... they improvised the design a little bit. They added some extra reinforcement straps to the chin strap and uh, the liner system and they added a rubber donut ring at the top to kind of help the helmet not sit right against the top of your head which helped with the impact protection and the U.S. decided to remove that. They scrapped that. They didn't want the, the rubber ring and they improved the shell design overall actually. They, they used a, a thicker gauge of steel. They used a uh, a higher manganese or even higher chromium content than the British uses made it a uh, a harder steel. And um, that was used all through the 20s and 30s up until when this helmet came out. And this is the same 1917 shell except now it has a removable liner. It's held in place with a screw and this brass dome nut. And it's um has a different liner now instead of the oil cloth liner and everything like that. This liner was made removable because the early 1917... The liner was permanently fixed to the shell, so if anything went wrong with it, you had to scrap the whole helmet and get a new one. And the Americans really didn't like that because that ends up being cost-effective. Uh, very, you know, un-cost-effective. And this is the liner of the M1917A1. It's a leather liner stretched over an aluminum cross frame. You can see one of the tabs there for it. There's four tabs. Two on the sides and one on the front, and it's held in place. With these little bales that go through the steel bales connected to the actual shell. And this was a great improvement over the original liner because it's adjustable. And uh, it's removable if something goes wrong on it. It's made out of leather instead of oil cloth. Oil cloth breaks down in heat. Leather breaks down in heat too, but not as, not as quick as oil cloth does. And uh, it was padded with horse hair. So it was, a, it was real, a lot more comfortable than the 1917A1 helmets. And these... These were approved for use, the M1917A1s were approved for use to replace the M1917s in 1934. So the U.S. had the same helmet from 1917 to 1934. So these started to come out in 1934 and they were used until 1942 when they were originally replaced uh, by the M1, which everyone understands was America's like iconic World War II Korea-Vietnam helmet with the two-piece design. This was actually used in World War II. You can see uh, Marines uh, in the Pacific Theater with these, like early, early on, like Wake Island and stuff. You can see them with these. This one is actually a Navy piece, and it has uh, 270, if you can't see it right there, stenciled on the front. I don't know what the 270 means. Uh, the shell was actually uh, retrofitted in 1941. The stamp down there is 20C. It says 20 in the letter C, and that is like the the mark on it from the factory that made it and everything like that. You could see where it was uh, pinch welded right there in the back underneath the 20 seeds where they put the rim on it so it doesn't have a raw edge. 
And America used these in World War One and World War II. Well, the M1917, so not this version, but the, the one before it. Alongside this, there was a toss-up whether they were going to adopt the French Adrian design, which is a mild steel four-piece design riveted together. It's really pretty horseshit, but it was the first helmet ever. Or the British design, and you'll see soldiers in World War One with both depending on who they were serving in closer proximity to with. So, I don't know if any of the Adrians made it back into U.S. stock after World War One, or if they were kind of junked for all Brody designs. But, the M1917A1 was a pretty excellent, you know, placeholder until something better could be found. And... It really could have been updated a lot sooner. There was a lot better designs out there, as we could see from, like, the German Stahlhelm and stuff like that. And we'll get a get a look from above it here, and you can see it. Now, this one is painted in, like, a dark forest green, whereas, you know, the Army did more of the olive drab, a lighter color. But this is in, like, the forest green color, which is what the Navy used. And you can see the brass hardware, whereas um, a lot of army helmets you'll see have like more of the white metals and white metals are prone to rusting and stuff which is why the navy used brass because brass is a copper alloy it's very um prone to non-corrosion especially around seawater so you'll see the marines and the navy use a, a brass for a lot longer than than the army will so and i have the chin strap over the top right here now but i've seen them with both leather and canvas chin straps but all by the time in World War II they had the canvas chin straps on them. And it was replaced by this design here that everyone's pretty familiar with. This is this is the M1 steel pot shell, which has obviously way more improved protection than the M1917A1. And this officially replaced this in 1941, but it didn't fully replace it till the end of 1942. So Hopefully that covers all the uh, information on everything you wanted to know about the M1917A1 helmet and its major part to play. It's, you know, it should be a more iconic helmet. America used it for almost 50 years. So it's it's been around and uh, as far as the Merchant Navy goes, you could extend its lifespan out to like the 60s even. So 1917 to 1960, this helmet shell has been around, which is, it's a long, long, long time. And it really should be more well-known than it is. It's a really misunderstood, really well-forgotten helmet. It's overshadowed by the fact that it wasn't in the world's greatest conflict for that long. And a lot of people seem to forget about it. But this is again at the request of LEGO Designs. He really wanted to see an early World War II helmet. And hopefully this fulfilled all of his requirements on seeing something like this so he has some information to go behind it. And if he wants to know, uh, if you want to know any of the other colors and stuff like that, and uh, any of the other derivatives of this, uh, drop a comment and I could leave you some information about it, some sources and everything like that. Or if there's anything else you want to see, uh, please leave a comment as well. I got tons of other stuff to show. And um, please give LEGO Designs channel a look. He's got, he does like LEGO mock-ups and paint of minifigures and stuff like that. It's very interesting to see. Um, so I'll leave it right here and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.